Welcome to Missing the Mark, where we look for meaning in strange places. I'm Christopher. Today I'm going to talk about the subject of enjoying movies made by bad people. And this is something of a practical subject because, if we're being realistic, an awful lot of movies are made by bad people. And, um, I mean, they all are in the sense of by imperfect people because we're a fallen race and all people are imperfect and pretty darn imperfect for the most part. Um, that said, an awful lot of actors and directors and so on, if you actually learn about these people, it's very dispiriting. Um, you know, I'm, I'm thinking of, of the people who are involved in things that one loved, because they're often rather specially bad people. And uh, in fact, there, there's plenty of movies, and really this generalizes to other things like books and comics and so on too, um, where the people involved are um, like out to try to make the things that they're doing um, bad in the sense of convincing people of things that are not true and misleading people. Um, possibly misleading them within the lights of, of the vicious person doing it. Anyway, my point is not to dwell on that sort of thing. It's a fallen world, and uh, there's a lot of fallenness you're going to find in it. So the question is not, you know, whether or not it's fallen. Yeah, it obviously is. The question is, what do you do given that it's fallen? And, I mean, obviously one answer to this is the Puritan answer. Um, or the iconoclastic answer of let's just get rid of all art because, um, you know, it's, it's all made by bad people and it'll teach you bad things, so let, let's get rid of it all. And, uh, I mean, in some sense that's viable. Um, art is not strictly necessary for life. It's not a very viable strategy, though, because here's the thing. Art is an extremely good teacher. Art is an exceptionally good teacher, really. Things like movies, plays, books, novels you know, poems, etc. These are all very good teachers of truths, of moral truths, of philosophical truths, and so on. And so these really aren't things you want to get rid of because there is so much benefit that can be had from these things. So the question really comes up, how do you get the benefit without being misled by them? Well, uh, that's what today's video is about. And um, the answer to this really comes in from the fact that in, I'm gonna use movies, as I said, this generalizes. A movie doesn't have just one truth in it. A movie has many, many truths. Many of them are relatively small things, but they do contain such truths, even fairly trivial truths, as the fact that hands are connected to the body by arms. You will see this, and it's actually true. This is a truth that you do learn in movies, though you probably already know it going in. But I bring this up as an example that there are of just how many things are actually communicated because movies are made up of pictures you know where you get 24 pictures played per second so the picture itself contains a lot of truths the pictures relative to each other also contain a lot of truths then the things you understand through them things like characters and actions and so on all of these contain truths as well um now when i'm saying truths these all contain things that are purported to be true um, they are things that could be false. Now, special effects are an example of something that is false. So if you have a person who is pretending within the context of the story to be a wizard and they hold their hands out and fire comes out of their hands after they you know, say some magic spell, that is a putative truth, but it is not real. It didn't actually happen. Now, that is also the sort of thing that isn't going to mislead anybody, and I, this is not a tangent, by the way, this, this is a nice introduction to the, to the real point. It's not a, a putative truth that is false, which is going to mislead every, anyone, because everybody knows going in that the person involved is not really a wizard when they bring someone fire out of their hands and then throw it at somebody. They're not actually doing this. We all know that this is pretend, and we all know that they're using computers in order to help the pretend along. And so none of us are misled by this. None of us go about thinking that, like, actually, there's a wizard. This is the way that you do magic. I'm going to go and do magic like this myself because this is awesome because I saw it in the movie. Um, Three-year-olds kind of think that way a little bit until you explain it to them that it doesn't work that way, and then they go, oh, okay. It it's amazing. I mean, I, I literally... my. I've got three children, each of them at about the age of three understood the concept of fictional versus real. Um, I think my, my, uh, uh, my first son may have even understood that at two. Um, it, it's a really, really simple, straightforward concept, and people don't get misled by that form of pretend. So, where do they get misled? 
and by what sort of pretend. It's generally speaking, the, the really dangerous ones are the ones that tend to relate to happiness. The putative truths that relate to happiness, things like performing some action and then being happy that you did. This is the thing that is both, um, it's easy for an actor to fake, that, that's one of the, the main skills of an actor, is, is um, emoting, pretending to have various emotions, pretending to have various reactions to the thing that happened. But it's not necessary, but it's not, unlike, you know, casting fire, it's not special effects, you're not using computers in order to do this. We don't know that this is not the reaction a person would have. And so you can have something like, um, you know, a person who betrays a friend, who is a traitor in that sense, and then goes on to be happy about it, who is not, who does not feel guilt, who is not dead inside in various ways that they don't feel guilt, but there's even worse going on because their, their conscience has just been so hideously killed that they're an awful person. Um, this is probably the most uh, dangerous in the sense of the most misleading aspect of movies in that it is possible to portray a character who is extremely inconsistent, where human beings cannot actually be like this character and portray it because the actor is really good at pretending in the moment to be like that in a convincing sort of way. Um, so you can have something where you can have a person do something hideously immoral, like betray a friend, and then seem happy and not bothered by it. And real people aren't like that. They are either bothered by something deeply immoral or alternatively, there is something terribly wrong with them that manifests in a whole variety of other ways. Um, this is somewhat analogous to the movie Drunk. Um, and this is kind of one of the interesting things. Drunks in movies are often quite interesting. Um, a really good example of this is The Thin Man, old movie from the 1930s, uh, based on a Dashiell Hammett novel. Not very similar to the Dashiell Hammett novel, actually. And this is one of the reasons why, because in the Dashiell Hammett novel, the character is clearly an actual alcoholic. He's got problems. He really is not doing very well. He's drinking constantly, and it kind of shows that he's having these problems, uh, the sort of problems that an alcoholic has. In the movie, however, it is a sober man who is playing the drunkard. And so the sober man doesn't do all of the things that a drunkard would, including being intensely boring. Because if you've ever had the misfortune of being around a drunk, they're very boring people. They don't say anything interesting at all. Uh, they find some of the things they say to be interesting. Um, they find some of the things they say to be important, and they aren't either of those things. Drunks are just the most boring people in the world to be around. I, I know there's this sort of reputation that in, you know they're great for parties because they'll put lampshades on their head and do fun things. And uh, no, that's not drunk people. That's that's like tipsy people. That is to say, people who have had a lot of alcohol but not so much that they're drunk yet. Um, by the time they actually get drunk. They stop doing anything interesting. They're just, they do things like apologize to you over and over and over again. And things like vomit on your shoes. And things like apologize to you over and over and over for vomiting on your shoes. And so on. Um, and the, the thing about this, and why it's such a good example of what I'm talking about, is in the movie, they don't do that stuff. They keep it interesting. The person who is pretending to be drunk, you know, will pretend to have not very good balance... Um, or possibly not, even in The Thin Man, he often didn't. But, um, you know, they'll often be sipping martinis, or things that look like martinis, but are probably actually water. And, um, you know, they'll be sipping those things, they'll dash off clever one-liners that actually make sense, that are grammatical, that aren't hideously repetitious, and so on. They will do things like be able to move quickly, they'll be able to have good coordination when it's called for. Um, they'll do things like think, they'll have basic... Um, a basic sense of proportion that actually matches what a sober person thinks is important, and so on. Because they need to be interesting to the audience, and moreover, it's a sober person doing this, so they're capable of it. Drunk people aren't capable of it, that's not how drunk people act. And so, it can be highly misleading to, to a person to think like, oh, when people drink a lot, drinking all the time like they did in the 1930s, they were so fun and so witty and so interesting. Um, it, I don't think a person's going to go too far that way because they're going to, I think, I mean, they're either going to say, like, I'm going to try drinking a lot and seeing how that works, and it works really badly. Um, 
Same way, like, if, you, if you're, as a kid, you think, like, oh, look at the way people interrupt each other and get off these witty one-liners at each other's expense, and they love each other for it, and it's great, people like me for that, and you try it three or four times, you'll find out, no, that's a complete failure. Um, and so, a lot of the, those sorts of things are self-correcting. Um, they, they can also be self-correcting the other way. Like in The Thin Man, I didn't get the sense he was drinking all the time. Like he'd often have a martini, but he'd only take the occasional sip out of it. Because, um, and this just comes down to how you make movies. Like when you take 30 takes, you don't want to be actually as an actor drinking very much, even if it's just water in, in there, because you're gonna have to go to the bathroom if you actually like drank an entire glass for each take. And so what actually ends up in the movie is not actually very much drinking. Um, they, you know, they'll take a little sip or something, and that's what makes it into the movie. So given that the person was acting entirely sober, I took him to just not actually be drinking very much, to often pour drinks, um, to be social, but like not actually drink very much out of it, because you don't see him drinking much out of it, you don't see him acting like he's drunk much out of it, and so on. So that was sort of the way I took it. Then I read the book and realized, oh no, no, this guy's an... This guy's a high-functioning alcoholic, but he's an alcoholic, and he's got a lot of the problems that even high-functioning alcoholics have. Um, and so, um, a lot of these sorts of things, and I've used all this as an example, a lot of these sorts of things are somewhat self-correcting in one way or another. Um, there's even, uh, there's, there's another thing which is more extreme, which I'm going to get to. Um, but I want to sort of highlight what it is about the self-correcting stuff that makes it actually work. Why is it self-correcting? It's self-correcting, well, either in one of those two senses. Either, and the more important sense is really going to be the first one. So, um, I'll turn it into the second one, uh, by disposing of the less important one. They're the ones where you're wrong, but you're going to try it and find out that this is not how life works really quickly. And so they're not really all that pernicious because if you've either been raised correctly or you try it, you're just going to find out, like, no, that's not how life works. Um, and, and you'll try it very quickly and it won't have many consequences. Um, and this sort of ties into, like, why it won't have many consequences ties into the, the other um, aspect of this, which is a lot more important, which is we already know an awful lot about life. And the thing is, we're fairly good at, at a subconscious, not conscious level, figuring out how things interact with each other, how the various pieces lock into each other, uh, pieces of reality, like how things fit together. And so given that we already know a lot of things, we will tend to interpret whatever we see in light of what would make it true. So as long as you already know a fair amount about life, when you see, because everything in art is incomplete, when you see this incomplete thing that may have been based around um, a lie, around something that's not true in the artist's mind, when you receive it, you're going to take it differently than the artist meant it because you're going to take it in ways in which it could actually be true. You're going to take it in ways um, th that actually make sense. And so um, it's going to, it's not going to be a real conscious formal process. You're not going to say like, oh, I'm going to, I see the mistake that the artist is making here and I'm going to fix that. Every once in a while you can. Um, and every once in a while, like, there's a song I like which is based on a Chesterton poem, and uh, there are a few minor tweaks to the poem. Most of them, are, you know, don't really matter, but one of them actually did. And the poem said, Rattle out reasons, it's worthless to me, um, gathering sand while the gold goes free. And the uh, singer changed it to, Rattle out reason, it's worthless to me, gathering sand while the gold goes free. And that radically changes the meaning of it, because Chesterton was very, very, very pro-reason. What he was saying in Rattle Out Reasons was that the things that a human being can articulate will be insufficient to capture the full truth of what's going on, especially the um, especially counter-arguments to the faith, that they're just so pale by comparison. He was not denigrating human reason, but particular arguments, the particular arguments you can actually find. Now, the artist screwed this up, and she is singing Rattle Out Reason. But you know what? When I sing along, I just change it to reasons in my head. It, it, you know, if I sing along, I sing reasons. If I'm not singing out loud, I still just remember, like, no, it's supposed to be rattle out reasons, and it's fine. So you can occasionally fix things on a conscious level, but most of the time it doesn't work that way. Most of the time it works that your interpretation of what the art actually is, of what, what's being depicted, is something that would turn it into something that makes sense. That is to say, into something that is true. And this is the thing, if you talk to people, people don't like talking about their interpretations. 
Because um, vocalizing, put, you know, putting into words things that people think on a subconscious level is something most people really dislike doing. But uh, if, if you're not necessarily all that nice to them and, and will just, you know, sort of hunt this down and find out what they really think about it, you will find this is, in general, how people interpret things that they like. They always interpret them in ways that make them actually true, in ways that make sense. Um, so this is the typical uh, way that that's done. Now, this does rely upon them knowing things ahead of time. So art made by bad people is most dangerous to children because they just don't have much of a framework and they are more likely to accept the thing in the spirit of the mistake that was originally made than to automatically correct it because they don't have enough knowledge and information to automatically correct it. Um, Good example of this. I made a video um, a while back on authority figures in movies. And a lot of people who don't have any experience with authority figures, and children generally don't accept that sort of on the receiving end of, uh, of this very unequal adult-child authority figure, um, a lot of them, they don't have that experience, and so they don't understand that the authority figures in movies are these odd caricatures, largely for the sake of the plot, and not very indicative of real authority figures, because a real authority figure, I'm not going to recap the entire video I did, but a real authority figure is somebody who's got a goal and has people under him that are working towards this goal, and so his main, the, his main avenue to success is working with them, helping them, um, helping them to achieve that same goal that he has so that they, they work together. So a lot of it is making sure that they have what they need, protecting them from various other things, both within the institution and outside the institution, that will keep them from achieving that shared goal. And so a leader, if you may have heard the term servant leader, servant leadership, but like this is basic leadership. A basic leader is not trying to impose his will upon unwilling people. A, a leader in most circumstances when you're not talking about things like prison guards, um, or things that are remarkably like prison guards, which are uh, teachers in public schools, um, very similar relationship. You're legally required to be here, and they need you to obey them, and because there are far, far more of you than there are of them, and so they need obedience in particular ways, and so on. It's, it's a remarkably similar relationship, and so a lot of same things apply there. But when you're not talking about those particular authority relationships, outside of that, authority actually looks vastly more like servant leadership because, well, you're all here to achieve the same goal. And so you want to set up your, you know, you want to set things up such that, um, you know, part of it is, is things like setting things up such that um, your goal is actually, uh, the goals that you set up for the people that you're overseeing are conducive to the bigger picture goal. Um, there's some very funny stories uh, about programmers, about things like paying people for the number of bugs fixed, which is not doing this. And um, be because that's just setting up a goal of fixing a bug. But if you're doing that to the people who are, um, you know, introducing the bugs to, you actually are giving them an incentive to create more bugs. You would need to come up with something where the incentive is to create the fewest number of bugs possible. Um, and that is aligning goals. So, you know, leadership involves some of aligning goals and a lot of making sure people have the resources they need, protecting them from things that, that would prevent them and so on. Real leadership. You almost never see real leadership in movies. Um, it's incredibly uncommon. In fact, the only case I can... Eh, the only case I can really think of to see real leadership um, off the top of my head is Transformers Prime, which was a vastly better cartoon um, than most any cartoons you'll see. Um, something I watched with my son. And, um, yeah, it's really kind of curious. Like, Optimus Prime is an actual hero in that. He is an actual leader in that. He is genuinely wise in that. And you see him doing that sort of leadership. He protects his people. He makes sure they have what they need. He, he will sometimes do things like discipline, but he also does a lot of things like being patient of seeing whether or not people have learned the appropriate lesson, and if they have, stopping there. Um, it's a really remarkable show in a lot of ways. And actually, um, this does bring up something when it comes to how children can be misled that is very important as a parent, which is to watch the shows with your children. And the reason why you should watch shows with your children, I believe me, I know 
how useful it is to have them watch something while you're doing something else. But that said, it's important to put in the time to watch their children's shows with them because you can then talk to them about these shows and make sure that they're learning the right lessons from them, not the wrong lessons from them. Sometimes they, because this will come up, like, and it may not even be because the show is bad. It may just be because children make all sorts of mistakes due to lack of experience, and it is incredibly valuable to make sure they're learning the correct lesson, to talk with them about it, to point out, like, yeah, there was a really good lesson in this of, you know, of this thing, or, like, you know, what did you take away from this? And, you know, maybe not in that sort of terminology, but, you know, talking to them about it, finding out what they got from it, making sure that they're getting the right things from it, because, um... You know, this is something I learned when I was, I was teaching uh, Lindy Hop. Like, when you do a demonstration, people will often look at the wrong things. People will look at your hands when they should be looking at your feet, or your feet when they should be looking at your hands, or your feet or your hands when they should be looking at what your, you know, the main part of your body is doing. And so that's why it's very important, like, when you're teaching a skill like Lindy Hop, you know, physical skills where you're doing demonstrations, tell people before you do the demonstration what they're supposed to learn from it, what they're supposed to be watching, in that demonstration. Don't just do the demonstration and hope they were paying attention to the right thing despite not knowing what they're supposed to be doing. Tell them that ahead of time and they will learn much, much more effectively. Very similar thing applies to any time you're dealing with children and art. If you tell children what they were supposed to learn from the things they just saw, they'll do a much better job of learning it. And this brings us actually very nicely to the, um, to the sort of final aspect of this topic, which is dealing with uh, malicious art. And uh, malicious may not be exactly the right word, but it's close enough. Art where people are trying to smuggle in terrible ideas. Now, they may believe in these ideas, so they, they may be telling, you know, they may be trying to tell the truth in that they're trying to, they're saying things they believe to be true, but if these things are false, it really doesn't matter whether or not they are being honest in that sense, because they will still hurt you just as much, in the same way that a person who has a communicable disease will get you sick, whether they intend to or not, by sneezing on you. It doesn't really matter whether or not they were trying to get you sick when they sneezed on you, you still need to take precautions because they will get you just as sick, whether they meant it or not. Same way, person who believes terrible things, like, um, you know, believes that um, fornication is the path to happiness who is trying to put this into art, who is consciously trying to have characters who fornicate and are happy for it, who live happy, fulfilled lives where things don't go wrong because of the fornication, but instead go right because of the fornication. Um, you'll find that that's one of the big ones, given what our culture is like right now. You'll find lots of, you know, lots of variants of this. You'll find the, you know, um, the, the uh, trying to live your own life in the sense of, um, you know, making your life whatever you want it and disregarding other people's needs in order for you to be fulfilled. Uh, that's another one you'll see a bunch of. Um, there, there are lots where the artist is specifically trying to construct the thing to get this message across. Now, in really, really extreme circumstances, these may simply be movies to avoid. But what's kind of interesting is in really extreme circumstances where they really put in this and very little else, these things will be truly awful movies. The only way that such a movie even has any chance of being watchable is by having a lot of true things in it. If the movie is all false, if, um, if it contains lots of things like a person showing up and, and saying, you know, man, I hate your ugly face, and the other person's like, oh wow, so great to see you too, and none of that, it's not, neither of those things is sarcastic, they're both sincere, that's a terrible movie. It's a really, really bad movie. And the thing is, this will carry throughout the movie. If the whole movie is similarly that not related to reality, you're just going to hate it. You're not going to like it at all. And so in order to have a movie in which you have some sort of truth, uh, I'm sorry, some sort of lie that is attempting to be inserted into this thing, it's going to have to be surrounded by a large amount of truth in order to make this movie palatable in any way. Here's the really interesting thing about that. If you have an enormous amount of truth in your movie and try to smuggle in a lie, it's not going to go together. It simply will not work together. They will not fit together. And so, the artist has one of two, um, basically, well, sort of one of three possibilities. 
Um, one possibility, the, the sort of trivial one, is the artist doesn't even notice that these two things don't get, go together, and this just looks like a straight-up plot hole. Um, this will tend to go with incompetence and just not make a good movie. Now, the next thing... So, so you won't tend to see this very often because you won't have to worry about it because they won't be very good movies and so no one will be talking about them. You're not likely to see it. Just isn't likely to come up in practice, though it's entirely possible. The artist has one of two possibilities, uh, two, two things here. They can either try to stick to actually making their lie work within the context of this and so they'll end up pushing the problems, like they'll make things around their lie consistent and then they'll have a lot more problems around it uh, to push, and about the only way they can make that work even a little bit is by trying to make all of those things very poorly defined. Uh, so you will, um, you will see a lot of, uh, you'll see this, I think you'll see this more often in science fiction where you can get by with lots and lots of promises, of, uh, you know, hints of how things work without them actually working, like, you can have things like, um, you know, an, uh, an all-male species which literally has no meaning whatsoever. Male only has a meaning in relationship to female because male and female refer to two um, types of a species that are capable of reproducing with each other, where one of them, which we call the female, produces the functioning cell that doesn't have all of its uh, DNA, and the other produces basically just some of the DNA that gets inserted into this to turn it into a fully working new cell. Male only means something in that context, and so when you say an all-male species, you're, you're, that, that literally doesn't mean anything. You might say they're hermaphroditic, you might say they're non-sexual. Um, there are plenty of examples here on Earth of non-sexual species, of hermaphroditic species, and so on. Uh, the hermaphrodites are where they're both male and female, so if any two meet, the, the male organs can seminate the female organs of the other one, and vice versa. Um, earthworms are like that, I believe. And then you'll find hermaphrodites, you will find... Um, things that are not sexually reproducing, that just sort of clone themselves. Although, you know, like bacteria divide. Although there's a curious thing where bacteria actually can, like, share DNA with each They establish these bridges and share DNA with each other. It's not sexual reproduction, but it's got some of the same functions of it. It's, it's um, interesting and odd. But anyway, um, so the thing about that sort of thing, where you end up pushing, you know, taking the line, pushing it out further, and then getting lots of poorly defined things, self-contradictory things, things that make no sense, or if you're going to make it kind of work, um, you know, uh, just sort of loose promises of there being some sort of answer without actually giving any of them ever. But the weakness in this from, you know, when the artist tries to, you know, sort of make at least the, the central lie consistent with stuff around it, so falsifies there, is you get a big undefined or poorly defined um, buffer area. So large amounts of the thing become poorly defined. And so the thing um, that happens here is that since there's all this poorly defined stuff or various contradictions, you will not swallow the main thing if you, if you have, pay any attention at all. If you pay attention, you won't swallow it because there are all these problems and it's related to all of these problems. And so you, need, you know this is not a finished work. This thing, parts of this need to be changed for this to be real. And so when you know that, that parts of this have to be changed in order to be real, when you see gaping plot holes, what you do is you pick out whichever true things within this you happen to like and ignore the rest. And whenever you see movies with lots of plot holes and talk to the people who actually like these things, it's exactly what they do. They don't like the movie as a whole. They don't swallow the movie as a whole. They don't really learn anything from the movie as a whole. There are the bits and pieces that they like, and they take that and throw away the rest. And, um, and they don't you know, necessarily do it consciously, but in terms of what are the parts they remember, what are the parts they quote to people, what are the parts they you know, actually like rewatching, and so on, it's always bits and pieces that, if you look at them in the way that they are being enjoyed by the person who likes this thing, are true in that context. Uh, you know, that is to say, these isolated bits that are the only parts they care about and only parts they're paying attention to are, generally speaking, true. And you'll find that. And so, if the artist who is acting maliciously tries to embed the lie in this fashion, it will, generally speaking, not work for that reason. It produces lots and lots of contradictions all over the place. And uh, people then just accept whatever they like in bits and pieces, which is, generally speaking, never the central lie, unless they wanted that central lie in the first place. In which case, there's no harm done, really. I mean, maybe a slight affirmation of somebody in their lies, but meh. 
I doubt that even has very much of an effect. The final thing is if the artist then changes enough of the central lie that it is superficially true and hopes that people will... Um, there isn't even really a good description for it, which is why I'm kind of searching for words, but essentially hopes that people will decode the message and figure out what it really means. And, um, and so you, you get, um, you, you get things where, like, some action is symbolic of, uh, of sex, for example. But the problem that comes up with this, the problem that you always have when the artist changes things enough that the thing is merely a metaphor for what they actually mean, is that they never, is that they, they, well, again, they, they, this has sort of two sub-variations, but one of them is almost never taken. They never make the thing a perfect metaphor, um, because if you made it a, a truly perfect metaphor, you might as well just stick the original in anyway. In order to try to make it pal palatable, they make it an imperfect metaphor, where the metaphor works, but pieces of the metaphor simply do not correspond to the real thing. So um, something will be symbolic of sex, but the problem is, it doesn't actually make new people. And so, activities that don't produce new people have a very different moral component to them than activities which do produce new people. And so, they will try to say that, like, this thing is just fine with our metaphor for sex, and they're probably right, because the metaphor for sex doesn't have the relevant properties that sex actually does of doing things like making new people who then need to be raised and have natural rights to their parents and to their parents' time to raise them and teach them what it is to be human. And so, um, this approach still doesn't really work to sneak things past somebody who isn't trying to cooperate with the lie, because if you take the metaphor where things have been changed, so the metaphor actually works and is therefore palatable, Seriously, if you take the metaphor seriously, you simply will not take it as a metaphor for the thing that they were hoping it to be a metaphor for, because it's not. So you'll have an activity where, you know, like, like um, let's say that if two people hold hands, they can produce a mega shield in front of them. You know, they, they hold each other's hand and they both put their hands up and then a mega shield that'll stop all laser weapons comes up in front of them. And this is supposed to be a metaphor for sex. Well, it's not because this is just producing a defensive shield that lasts for a few seconds. It has no needs of the people who are being defended by the mega shield that they, they you know, create while they're holding hands. And so nothing about sexual morality applies to this thing. And so when you say that, like, it's fine to join hands and make mega shields with different people, yeah, it is. That, that doesn't mean it's fine to have children by different people, because children aren't mega shields. They're, they're, they're not really alike in any way. So like, yeah, I can see that you were hoping that this would be a metaphor for sex and saying like, uh, okay, I can hold two people's hands at once and create a bigger mega shield. And so, you know, etc. Yeah, that's actually fine in your metaphor. Works just fine. And if you take the metaphor seriously, there's, there's nothing wrong with that. It's not actually conveying any lies. It's only if you cease to take the metaphor seriously and say, despite the glaring flaws in this metaphor, I'm going to treat it as if it's a metaphor for sex, even though it is clearly not a metaphor for sex. That's when you could go wrong, but no one is going to do that. This is where you get to, um, and this is where I see a lot of criticism, actually, that, that is very, very misguided criticism. Because here's the thing. The only people who have a chance of learning bad lessons from art are people who take the art seriously. People who do not take the art seriously don't learn things from it. If you just say, it's like, yeah, it's just a bunch of people pretending. It's, you know, okay, there's some cool flashy lights on occasion. That's kind of neat. But, like, otherwise, yeah, this is just a dumb waste of time. Those people don't learn, mislearn things about reality from art. It's only the people who really love it, who really say, like, this has deep truths in it, who learn things from it. But they're also the people who actually take the art seriously as presented. Those people who say, like, this is really good art, this is a phenomenal movie, do not say, this is a phenomenal movie and it's a really bad metaphor for this other thing, but you know what? Who cares about all the properties within the fictive thing? All that matters is, is the real thing. So I'm going to ignore most of the properties of the fictive thing that I actually love in order to make this a metaphor for this real thing. And then instead of thinking about the real thing, I'm just going to take stuff from the movie that I'm not taking seriously right now you can see why people don't do it. Now, 
I'm voicing this in words. I'm not saying that people would normally do this in words. They do this instinctively. They do this in the space of, you know, a moment that they, you know, take to not see this as a metaphor because it doesn't work as a metaphor. The, um, this is the reason why, and then again, this is adults who know things about real life. Um, now, interestingly, children will not take this stuff as metaphors because children often don't even know. Like, like, you know, young children, for example, don't know anything about sex, and so they're not going to take this as a metaphor for sex because they don't even know about it. By the time they're old enough to know about it, they're probably going to have forgotten this thing, and in any event, you're not going to think of it as a metaphor because when they learn about sex, it's going to be very disconnected, time, you know, temporally speaking, contextually, and so on, and they will immediately see the things about sex, like making a new person you have to raise, that have nothing to do with this really cool way that these, you know, awesome people with the laser weapons were able to produce shields, in my made-up example. And so that sort of thing actually tends to be, I think, of all of them, the least dangerous to children, because when you've got a metaphor that simply doesn't actually work, that's trying to be snuck by, you only even recognize this thing as a metaphor basically by incidental language that the uh, writer will put in, where at the moment the way people talk about something happens to be with certain catchphrases, certain phrases. And so, you know, like, like to give an example of a, a phrase of what I mean, like, you know, if you were to say, my body, my choice, in, eh, even in 2020, it's sort of on the wane, um, as a catchphrase, but like that's a catchphrase you would recognize right now. In 2040, it's likely not going to be a catchphrase. The the if, if we still have the pro-abortion movement, we probably will. They will have moved on to other catchphrases because people always change their catchphrases over time. And so by the time somebody who is eh, 2015, call it. By the time I'm sorry, 2035. By the time you know somebody who is three years old now is 18 years old in 2035, that sort of incidental stuff will largely have changed. And so, and it's also, the incidental stuff is generally the least memorable part of it. And so people, you know, kids are not going to really remember that aspect of it. They're not going to see it. If they go back and watch it and some of that stuff is still around, they'll say, like, oh, huh, didn't notice that before. There was that thing and I, I kind of see that like, yeah, they're kind of like this, but that doesn't really work. Because the kid latched onto the actual meaning of the metaphor, not to the sort of incidental things. The kid didn't have a decoder book on hand. And by the time the decoder book will do the kid any good, they will have moved on in some very important ways. And besides, they're not going to really accept it. So the thing about coded messages is that they don't really work. You know, we're, we're coded message in the sense of where there's a code book, where like, you read through and there's a certain, there's a meaning, but like if you, not as a metaphor for something else, but you pull out the code book and you look up, okay, well, if I replace this word with this word and this word with this word, then I get a different sentence that meant something different than in the original. And aha, this is telling me, you know, kind of analogous to taking a record and playing it backwards. Like, yeah, uh, it doesn't work. It's not how human minds work. It's not how human brains work. The only people for whom this would ever work are people who are already sold on the idea by the time they get the code book and look the stuff up, and be, at which point they're going to be like, right on, this affirms the thing that I already believe for different reasons now anyway. It's not going to be anything that ever convinces anyone of anything. And because it didn't work as a metaphor, which is, remember, this is one of the, um, is by hypothesis in, in this branch of what the artist can do, because it doesn't work as a metaphor, it doesn't teach them anything about the structure of reality. You can see this uh, very differently, by the way. If you want to see a metaphor that actually works, you can look at C.S. Lewis's The Chronicles of Narnia, in which in The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, Aslan the Lion, who comes in and seems to be gentle, allows himself to be captured by evil, but in allowing himself to be killed on the stone, you know, on the stone table by the White Witch, that destroys the stone table and is where the witch gets conquered. Then the lion comes back under his own power. Aslan comes back under his own power and then leads the defeat of the white witch. This is a metaphor for Christ and the metaphor actually works for Christ. So that if you really love the lion, the witch and the wardrobe and then meet Christianity, you will see the thing that you recognize because the metaphor actually works. So um, this is very different because it works 
Well, because Christianity is true. But um, leaving, not emphasizing that for the moment, this is a metaphor that actually works. And so you can recognize the one in the, in the other because the artist here did not screw up the metaphor in order to make the metaphor palatable. He put it there, he put the thing into the story, and let the thing stand as it is. Now, um, this is not what happens when people deal with lies. When people deal with lies, they don't put the metaphors in in ways that work, because they can't. It's fundamentally impossible to make them work. Now, um, there are... Eh, all right, I'm, I'm sorry, there's a tangent, but I'm actually stopping myself from going on this tangent, because it's very, very tangential. So, um, this is the thing about art, and about art made by people who are meaning it badly, that they can never be completely explicit about it. Because if they're completely explicit, it'll just be stupid. And so this is their Achilles heel. This is why somebody who's trying to lie through art will always have a terrible time of it. Um, this is why it's much easier to, to lie in something like philosophy, because you're just stating things outright, and it's, po it's much more possible to seduce people because you're not dealing with the entire intellect. You're only dealing with, um, for the most part, since you're doing it through speech, you're only dealing with, with sort of the abstract intellect, and the abstract intellect being the weaker part of a person's entire intellect, has a harder time grasping everything at the same time, and so has a harder time seeing problems. Art, since it deals with more of the intellect at once, really the, the person who's trying to sneak an evil message in is hamstringed by that fact. The thing that makes it such a great teacher, because you can present so much truth all at once together because of the way many things fit together all at once, is at the same time the thing that makes it not work very well for sneaking in lies. As long as you have people who already know a fair amount and therefore have the ability to reject it. And so there becomes simply a dichotomy. Art made by evil people can be appreciated safely by people who already have knowledge and wisdom coming into it, that is to say competent adults, who are coming into it and are you know, engaging their mind, who are paying full attention, who are taking the thing seriously. Because if you take the thing seriously, it will either not work on its own or be obviously false. And the artist who's trying to sneak something in has to go in one of those two ways. He won't be able to do anything else. And so for adults, generally speaking, no, I'm not talking about things like, like, like you know, semi-pornographic films, because um, th there are all sorts of problems at that level when, you, when you're showing unclothed you know, people in, in sexual positions where, um, you know, because our, our sexual instincts are so very strong in adults. Um, this is the one ironic thing that, you know, a child of, of eight could watch pornography and not be particularly harmed by it, at least in the, the moment, simply because it doesn't, it won't register, it doesn't have any of those instincts that it's trying to prey upon. I'm not saying you should watch pornography, I'm just saying there's sort of an irony in that very, very narrow little thing. I'm not saying that that couldn't harm the child much later because people have memories. Again, I'm not saying children should watch porn. Um, in that very, very narrow, immediate sense, there is sort of an irony that there are some things that children are safe from that adults are not. Um, in, the, in the moment, not long term. Now, um, in general, though, for art made by bad people trying to sneak in lies, an adult can, a competent adult can generally watch them and be safe in this thing, taking away all of the truths that the artist had put in that are actually true, the actually true uh, period of truth, taking away that and simply rejecting the part of it that is imperfect and was intentionally imperfect. Children, because they don't have that experience to draw on, need to, as children always need to, have somebody they can trust who knows what's going on to explain things to them. And it often doesn't take very much explanation, interestingly enough. It, it, it's not like a deeply complicated thing because um, artists being very limited as human beings can only put in so many intentional falsities to it. And these things are relatively easy for an adult to explain to a child. Now, I am not saying by the way, that that means show anything to a child and just be there to explain it to them. I do mean, if you're going to show something to a child, be there. At least the first time. You know, watch a movie with your kid the first time. The second time, it, they can watch it on their own. The third time, the fourth time, the fifth time, and so on, they can watch it on their own. Although, it's a good idea to go back every now and again in case there's something you missed to re-explain to a child. 
It takes a lot of time, but it's absolutely worth it. Um, but in general, no matter what it is, because it will have been made by imperfect people, even if they're not malicious, you should watch things with your children. You know, art that you're, you know, um, I mean, on the plus side with, with books, you're probably going to be reading it to the child until they're, you know, a ways older. In which case, it's a really good idea to also read the things um, that your children are reading. Now, one good way of doing that is by taking all the good stuff that you've read and giving it to your child to actually read. Um, because, you know, then you will have already done that and you'll be able to talk to them about it and so on. There really is, in the raising of children, no substitute for being able to talk with them about the art that they're experiencing because you are their primary teacher and so you should be able to comment on anything that they are learning from. Um, so I, I'm not saying show children anything. I'm saying um, anything you do show them, make sure you've seen it, at least with them, at the same time. Because you can comment on it in real time. You can comment on it immediately after it happens. And it's still extremely useful. Um, these aren't magic spells. They are, you know, ideas. And ideas are reflected upon and thought and take a while to be absorbed. And so, you know, giving somebody a counter idea right afterwards works. Because, as I said, they're ideas. They're not magic spells. Um, when it comes to what you actually show children, well, this becomes a tremendous amount of judgment in terms of, you know, wisdom in a practical sense of, what does the child know? You're the, you have a good sense of what they know. What will they get out of this? What can you explain to them about it to make sure they don't get the wrong things out of it? And there'll be things that you should not show them, and there'll be things that maybe it's perfectly safe to show them as long as you're there to talk with them about it as they watch. Um, so, uh, again, just to, to reiterate that main point of it's a really, really good idea to... Um, you know, to play the games that they are playing, to watch the movies that they are watching, and so on. And man, does it take a lot of time, but, well, that's uh, part of the job of being parent. So, um, that's as far as children go, and then as far as, um, as far as adults go, again, know your limitations. It's an incredibly important thing. It's a little bit hard, because if you haven't seen it, you don't have anyone to recommend it to you. You have to go in a little bit on your guard, not in like a, a really hostile way, just a little bit on a, um, if you have no idea what you're getting into, you want to make sure to pay close attention because it's by paying close attention that you will see whenever there are actually problems in the art. And those problems mean that there is something false. And so, um, you know, th that sort of lacks a daisical attitude of, eh, it's just a movie, who cares about the plot holes? Well, in some sense that works as long as you are not actually paying attention to any of it and about the only thing you really care about are the like, you know, flashes of light and explosions and cool sounds. Okay, fine. That, that will kind of work. In general though, the thing about art is it is least dangerous when you are paying the most attention to it. And so if you're dealing with art that may be made by somebody who is putting lies into their art, whether intentionally or unintentionally, the best way to be safe from it is to pay really careful attention because that's the way you're going to actually discover this thing. And I don't mean in an abstract sense. I don't mean like have your check boxes of like what did they do wrong here, but rather pay attention to who the characters are, pay attention to what the characters think, pay attention to how the characters react, pay attention to what the characters know for all of them. This is incidentally simultaneously the way you get the most out of something if it's good. If the movie is good and, and it will be good in some parts, at least. If the movie is good, you get the most out of it by paying attention. If the movie is bad, you are safest from it by paying attention. The most dangerous thing to do is to sort of eh, lackadaisically not pay attention and then occasionally see, you know, cool stuff that's kind of appealing that you didn't, don't really think about. That is the most dangerous way to watch a movie. It is also the way you'll get the least out of a good movie as well. So, um, yeah, in terms of adults watching movies made by people who may be sneaking in lies, pay attention. Pay attention to the art as art. And that's the way you'll be best protected from it, and the way you'll get the most out of it. Until next time, may you hit everything you aim at.